I didn't think I had anything to give. I wasn't one to join organisations, let alone charities, which I would have seen in those days as do-gooder organisations. We were living a pretty hard existence in a rainforest in western Golden Bay, mainly with big beautiful trees, but there were clearings that we made and we were trying to make a living growing tropical fruit, um, semi-tropical fruit. I was the Pepino king of the South Island for a year until that market collapsed and then I started growing organic kiwi fruit. Made a loss every year, so after a few years I had to take a chainsaw to the crop, which was pretty hard. But my wife at the time said, the family's got more benefit out of my garden than they have out of the kiwi fruit orchard that you've been prioritising all these years. And that was a penny drop moment, and I realised that instead of trying to grow fruit in a rainforest, it made a lot more sense to grow a leaf crop. I had a research background, so I looked up the herbal compendium. We only had small acreages, so small clearings here and there in the bush, so it had to be a high-value crop. So I figured it had to be a high-value legal herb. Uh, so I looked up the herbal compendiums, and strangely, all the plants seemed to come from either North America or Europe. There was virtually nothing in the south, southern hemisphere, nothing out of New Zealand. So this got me kind of curious. We were surrounded by hundreds of different species in the rainforest where we were living. And I thought, well, look, surely some of these plants will have medicinal or herbal or culinary values. So I started looking at the science that had been done on these plants over the years and came across a really interesting paper out of the University of Canterbury where they discovered that the native plant Horopito, they took an extract of it, they put it against the leading uh, antifungal of the day, which is something called Amphotericin B, and they found that the extract of Horopito worked faster against Candida albicans and had a bigger zone of inhibition than um, Amphotericin. So this got me starting on some years of trials, which was one, to find Horopito plants that could be grown sustainably, that could be harvested, and safety trials to make sure that the product was safe on skin and oral consumption, and product development. So after a few years, I had a moderately successful business based on this Horopito plant. And then I met a guy who did think I had something to give. Chris Wheatley had been working on development projects in the underdeveloped world his whole professional life, and he thought that developing a business from an indigenous plant the way I had was something that could be applied in some of the places that he'd worked. I asked him what his favourite place to work was. He said it was Vietnam. So we, were, we had good complementary skills. Chris is sort of a, a really tight, well-organised guy, like he does organisation to a T, and I'm kind of more the looser entrepreneurial sort. So, But we got on really well personality-wise. So uh, together we put an application into NZAID, the New Zealand Government Aid Organisation, to do a project with the Hill Tribe people in northern Vietnam, right up by the Chinese border. Uh, this got funding because Chris writes a great application and for the next five years, not full time, but a lot of the time we're working on this project. We achieved quite a lot of what we set out to do. Um, the project won a UN award, so from an external perspective it was quite successful. We established oil stills, we set up nurseries so that the Hill Tribe people wouldn't keep going into the national parks and ripping off the, the medicinal plants that were growing there, which were getting quite endangered. And um, there was one particular plant, they call it the mountain turtle, great big tuber, and that had really interesting anti-cancer properties we found when we did lab work on it. And we got patents around those and put the patents with, left the patents with um, Hanoi College of Pharmacy. But I looked back on it and I thought, well, was this really effective? You know, most of the money got spent. I mean, Forest Herbs, our organisation, did its work pro bono, but a lot of New Zealand taxpayer money got spent. Most of it got spent between New Zealand and the Hill Tribe people, various ways. And I wondered afterwards whether it might have been more effective just to give $1,000, for example, to each of the families involved in the project. Um, it was really what I would call inefficient giving. In the meantime, back in New Zealand, my ex-wife 
had started a mail order supplement business that was going, it was actually growing better than my Horopito business, which narked me a bit because I saw myself as the clever business brain, but, but her business was going crazy. And the reason for that really was uh, she was very generous. She didn't believe that people should make money out of other people's ill health. So with her supplements, she would put on the very minimal markup that she needed to cover her direct costs. And I'd even see her doing things like if somebody ordered something and she thought that they should take something else as well, she would slip a, an extra bottle into the package. Um, now, you, that, that's probably what I'd characterise as excessive giving because she would periodi periodically run out of money, the business would, would run out of money, and they were completely run off their feet, as you can imagine. The word of mouth with that sort of service was extraordinary. So af after a few years... Uh, Lindley ran out of steam on that business, um, but it was still growing. Switch to me and my son filling in potholes on the gravel road up to the Horopito farm. And we're talking about the business, Health Post. And he's saying online was just starting to kick off at that stage and and he had some technical skills, good technical skills. And he said, I reckon if we put that business online, it could really go for it. And so I was, I was game for that. So we bought the business and it did go online. It was quite an effort to put it online back in those days. But we got there and the business just kept, kept growing really well, even though we did institute sustainable pricing and sustainable um, staffing so that so that it was a sustainable business. But we wanted to enshrine the generosity of spirit that was the foundation of it, that was the foundation of the success and also the, the ethos of the business. So we puzzled a bit how, how to do this and we instituted something called the Better World Programme. Now this was a choice of three charities at checkout, after checkout, you just tick which one you wanted which one you supported out of those three, and it would be a dollar from Health Post, the business, not one of your dollars that would go to that charity at the end of the month. Well, I thought this was a pretty good arrangement. It went for, for several years. We donated over a million dollars to 80 different sort of social and environmental causes. Uh, I loved its efficiency because you didn't have very much contact with the actual charity. They would apply online. I would sort of scan them online, just sort of see if they looked effective, um, minimal contact with the people, uh, and then they would get this drop of, of money into their check account at the end of the month. But I suppose part of that non-contact or minimal contact efficiency thing was that we didn't hear much back from them. So we weren't really that sure that the money was getting spent effectively. I mean, you, the assumption was, because they were good charities, that most of the money would get spent well, but there was no auditing. I mean, we were busy trying to run a, um, you know, an, an expanding online business. We didn't have time to get into the detail. So I'd probably characterise that as, as blind giving. But I thought it was, still thought it was pretty cool. But then one day my two oldest kids came to me. Um, my daughter, oldest daughter was in the business at that stage, and uh, and said, "Look, we don't think this Better World program is, is really the uh, you know the bee's knees. Like, we don't think it's really the optimal. Um, we don't think the staff relate to it that well. You know, they're sort of this murmurings that if we can afford to give money away to different charity each month, then maybe we can afford to increase wages. But the money was coming out of the bottom line, not the not the cost structure. So it was coming out of our profits. But but nonetheless, you could see that." So the, a little bit of disengagement there. Um, they said the customers can't really relate to, because we're changing charity each month, um, it's not, they don't identify the business with a cause. You know, it's just sort of this amorphous thing. Um, and so I, I accepted that and we were on the lookout for a cause that would really resonate with the staff, with the customers um, and with the family. Okay, cut to me flying down from Auckland late afternoon, coming into Nelson and just seeing that beautiful arc of farewell spit, 25 kilometres of, of sand dune that separates the wild Tasman Sea from beautiful Golden Bay where our business was based. And I thought, had a pop moment, 
put a fence across the base of that, you got yourself a great na nature sanctuary. Came to the kids with that idea, and they said, yep, good idea. And then went to the Department of Conservation, who owned that land, and quite surprisingly, really, they said, yeah, good idea, you know, especially if it's your money, good idea. <laughs> so um, Health Post Nature Trust was born. Now, what surprised me with that was I'd never really worked in a collaborative situation, especially not with a bunch of volunteers. And these people have been volunteering for years doing sort of environmental work. So one thing was I met all these really neat people that, that I didn't know existed, and they came on board. Just People just kept coming on board with their different skills. So Chris Wheatley, the Vietnam guy, he came on with his organisational skills um, to get everything quite tight and, and sensible and maybe the odd um, funding application because, again, with, with, when you're passionate about, about a project like this, you make every dollar count, and what was quite good was getting matching funding. This was something I hadn't even thought of, but Chris said, look, if we're putting putting some money in, then there's other people that will probably look at matching funding. You know, groups love matching funding. So so we were quite well funded. Um, and then all the volunteers coming on board with their different skills, like some might be fence builders, some might just want to do a, a predator trap line once a month, clear a trap line. Um, some rather grow plants, and we do a lot of wetland planting. Uh, the staff were right on board with it, the Health Post staff, because it's right there, it's their wild backyard, it's their wild and magnificent backyard, and the, the annual tree planting days that we used to have in Golden Bay and different bits of public land. Of course, we focus now on the Nature Trust territory, so every, every year they go back to, to look, and you can see the previous year's plantings going up, and they're putting new plants in, clearing around them, and so there's that fabulous sense of sort of ownership and growth. Uh, we've got videographers that, that, that volunteer their time, photographers. Uh, the thing has, has really got momentum. Uh, the latest thing we've, we've done, which has really warmed everyone's heart, we did build a fence. It wasn't across the base of, of Farewell Spit because that wasn't really sensible with the way the tide goes out for kilometres, but we put a fence, a predator-proof fence, across Cape Farewell, which is... Um, a wonderful uh, headland that sticks out into the Tasman Ocean, cliffs on three sides. We put a fence across the fourth side and we've just translocated 50 fluttering shearwater from an island in the sounds to the uh, Whareke Eco Sanctuary, we call it, where we've got burrows. We built artificial burrows with little hatches on them and we got these babies, flew them over to Golden Bay, put them in there, little chicks, uh, and had to hand feed them, we had volunteers come from all around the country actually to hand feed these. So it was quite a skill. We had to, to bring in a vet from Northland who had, had, had skills in this, in this region, in this area. Um, and we haven't lost a bird. So we, we reintroduced 50 and over the next few weeks feeding them sardines, smoothies, uh, had to weigh them. You have to give them exactly the right because they're, they're tubby little things to start with and you've got to actually thin them down, slim them down so they can fly away so they learn to fly as they, they get rid of their fluff and, and develop feathers. Um, and so, yeah, 50, 50 in and, and 50 flew away and they're going to be living out at sea for a few years and come back and start a mainland colony and there's there's very few mainland colonies of flooding shearwater. They've all been eaten out by the predators. So, so the buzz that we've got from that, the whole team has been absolutely fantastic. Not like anything I've ever known. So, uh, what what I'd really say to to any business that's got a reasonable cash flow is, or even individual, is find your giving thing. Um, it's Great for the planet, and it's it's absolutely fabulous for your for your soul and your psychology.